plática, talleres internacionales de bioinformática, taller 4, bioinformática para administradores de sistemas. Yo les voy a hablar, hablándonos un poco de lo que fue todo el taller de los dos años. Okay. Now again, as I said to the Galaxy session yesterday, I know you are tired, I know that you are, you know, you have a bad day in front of you, and, uh, you are, and so, but, but um, I suggest you, you listen up a bit because um, some of you will, or not, if not all of you, will have to deal with these issues. And... Um, The issue of uh, um, sometimes dealing with large NGS projects from an IT perspective is like trying to get like uh, you know the Harry Potter guys <laughs> through the wall. So you know if you don't know the magic, um, chances are that you will smash your head against the wall. I'm not recommending. I don't want you to do that. So uh, I guess I can warn you about things that I had to face and problems I had to face so that you know how to, to tackle them. So, um, I mean, you all keep hearing about the next generation sequences, though, whether they're called NGS or high-throughput sequencing, and, you know, I, I want to say a few words about what this thing is and why you need to be concerned with it. Uh, then I'm going to start outlining the uh, NGS IT challenges, you know, this this brick wall there that you need to go through. And uh, in particular, I, I would like to actually talk about the storage backend, the networking backend, and the computing backend. Okay? Because for high throughput sequencing or NGS, these tend to have very, very specific requirements, and they put very specific strains in the IT infrastructure that you need to know about. Okay. I mean, there's plenty of information on the web about, you know, uh, people that want to get the basic, the basic um, uh, knowledge of uh, biology and, and, and genomics. Um, but you have my slides here as an introduction. There are also nice other talks. I mean, if you, if you Google about uh, this type of information. Uh, But basically, NGS is concerned about the genome, okay? And, and how from uh, the genome we can decode or encode the sequence that builds the proteins, the building blocks, the proteins that actually make us, okay? So there is a, the molecular biology dogma here. This is a very nice... Uh, uh, E microscopy uh, picture of what's happening, what's happening when uh, DNA and RNA are transcribed into proteins. And NGS is all about the code that makes that happen. And to be more specific, biologists and life scientists are trying to record the code of life in order to understand how living things work work and what they are made of, okay, and, answers by, and answer by the questions. So uh, they also try to understand how the environment affects living things, because, okay, I can uh, take this as a computer screen and say, well, it's made from an LCD element, it's made from plastic, down here it has a PCB board and some electronics with slots. But what about if I place it in a very hot environment or very cold environment or in an environment where there is a lot of other frequencies? Will it function correctly or not? So using, using computer terms. And where all this information is assembled, like the sequences, the code, plus what this code does, so code plus annotation, are actually put up into a very big genome project, okay? And this project contains uh, not only what has been recorded, but what the scientists think is happening. They publish it, of course. They publish the annotation data. And, and uh, uh, in the process of doing that, they generate a lot of information. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, some people call it next generation sequencing or uh, high throughput sequencing. Because the important thing that concerns scientists as well, and, and pretty much managers that run facilities, is cost and time. Okay? And what these technologies have done, they've made us able to actually uh, record that code at an ever-decreasing time and monetary cost. Okay? Because you can put a definition of the sequencing throughput as the number of sequences generated over the time or in the cost. So at the beginning it was very, very, very expensive and very time consuming to, to actually sequence living things. But over the years, the evolution of, uh, of, of technology, sequencing technologies, made that easier, both in terms of time and in terms of money. Just bear in mind that when you see these acronyms here in sequencing projects, and you hear scientists talking about them, they are not exactly gigabytes, megabytes, or kilobytes. They refer to base pairs, okay? to the actual uh, bases that actually made uh, the, the DNA, the actual sequence themselves. So, gigabases 10 to the to the ninth, megabases 10 to the six kilobases, kilobases 10 to the three. Okay, but they are not referring to units of 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 data information, rather than the length of the sequences. Okay, so because that's a, often a cause of confusion. I mean, the, I had to deal with uh, explaining the specifics of high throughput technologies to many IT professionals, and the best example I could give you is something that you are familiar with as information technologies. And that is, you know, how you reverse engineer a piece of software. You know, somebody gives you a, a you know, binary or a set of DVDs, and, well, you might know what, what the program does, but you want to know how it does it, okay? So from here, you have to go through certain steps here, you have to see the software, you have to extract uh, certain parts of the binary, you have to analyze it, and at the very end, you need to get this thing, the source code, okay? And on the basis of the source code, which is one approximation of, you know, what this program does, the binary that you took, the, the DVD, you can actually make more accurate description and say uh, this program does this, this and that by performing these functions and combining these software modules. Okay? So that's a very typical way that one could, uh, a very typical procedure uh, that one could use to reverse engineer software. Well, in this particular case, the NGS case, the uh, life scientists try to do the same, or at least the, the goal is the same, okay? They're not always successful, but, you know, sequencing the whole thing and getting a genetic sequence is, is a good start. So, they start by preparing the sample, which I guess it's the equivalent of you putting the, the thing, the DVD ROM and say, hmm, let's see what we have here, what does this binary do? Okay, they pass it through uh, certain programs and certain procedures to, to repair it. I'm going to show a video exactly to see what they do, just for a visual reference in a, mi in a, in a minute. And after very, very careful processing, they take a series of images here. And these images define the, 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 the reading, the appropriate reading by the programs defines these things here, uh, which are reads of the genetic code. But because you're doing, you're reading different parts of the genetic code, like pretty much you would see different parts of the binary code on a program, trying to, to guess what's happening, then you have to stitch them together. You have to assemble them together. And this is the NGS, uh, or high throughput sequencing assembly, the sequence assembly part, which uh, actually has very, very demanding computational requirements, as we're going to see. And the final code, which is the, the you know, the, your source code, for example, of the program and the diagrams that explain what the software modules do, is the annotated genome, which means the sequence plus some code, some description of what all these things do. 
what does this sequence do, or what the scientists think the sequence does, because that's not always clear. Okay, so far? I mean, does that mean it's okay? Makes sense? And, you know, I'm sure you've heard or seen or, or read about uh, the, the high throughput uh, sequencing technologies. From the left here, we have a technology called pyro sequencing, uh, uh, made uh, li licensed now by Roche, uh, or go which goes by the name 454. Very uh, frequently used the Illumina Genome Analyzer here. Uh, some older technology, but really nice. I mean, when it comes to informatics part, is the, the solid analyzer from Applied Biosystems. And then, apart from these three, uh, these three, which uh, of course have the huge impact, the impact that I talked about about reducing the time and the cost, um, we are now getting into the era where it gets even cheaper, even faster to do personal uh, sequencing you know, have your, your own genome sequenced. So, for example, uh, these particular, th particular two technologies here, the Helicos and the Pacific Biosciences, are what we call single molecule sequencing analyzers. And again, the idea is to make it even cheaper and even faster to, to, to sequence things, living things. What I want to, to, to show you now is a, a small video that I have here. Uh, it doesn't have sound, so I'll try to talk through it and show you what happens when, when someone uh, actually goes through a typical sequencing project. This is, as I said in the earlier slides, the uh, preparation of the sample. You know, you can't take this or you can't take some tissue of a living thing and then you have to prepare it. You have to go through a certain procedure. Here is the scientist that tried to do this, and in fact, this plate here that you see, this is uh, the one that's actually used in the, in the Illumina genome analyzer. This is where you actually put the material with some special processing to make the reading easier. Okay? So this guy now goes through a process and puts the card in there, and what he's doing with this sort of pipes is this thing called flow cell loading. Again, I'm referring to the uh, Illumina genome analyzer. And uh, I mean, you can go and read about it using these terms, but the uh, idea is to enhance the clarity of, of the sequencing and the prepared sample so that the machine, when it's going to read it, it's going to have less conflict, less uh, trouble, okay? Uh, and uh, all this uh, ligand and uh, enhancement and uh, bridge amplification, these are chemical, biochemical procedures that make that happen, okay? So they amplify, so they clear this, this sample, and now they take this, this uh, glass plate, and then they will put it into the instrument there, where the optics of the instrument is going to attempt to read it, okay, and make sense of it. And this is this step here. Okay, so they place it very carefully there, and uh, then they close the door. You can see, for example, the attachment plates and the head. And here's what the machine will do. Okay, it will read whatever is in every row of the flow cell, there's this glass surface and attempts to determine the basis, like the code, by means of images. Later, when I'm going to talk about tired storage, and I say that the first tire, when it comes to data that comes out of the instrument, the images, these are the very images here. And these tend to take a lot of space. Okay? So they've done that row by row for the entire sample, and, you know, as the machine reads that, it, it performs what you call a typical read. And this is what, what the, uh, the video here tries to, to visualize. So they finish, let's say, with one row of the, the flow cell. And here's the reading process. It says, okay, from what I have from this image, I get these spaces. Okay. 
and that's one read. That's another read. There's yet another read. But you know, these reads overlap. They don't read the entire sequence. Okay, that's impossible. You can't. You can't. You can't do that. You can't have a complete sequence. You have to do many reads and then try to assemble them together. Okay, and that gets into the informatic part. This is a simple YouTube video that I think you know. Um, shows very well what, what, what's happening. Okay, so this is a typical process that uh, you know a scientist would do in the lab before they put it and you know they start dumping the images and the data and then that will mean that you will start uh, to be involved there and you'll see why in a minute. Okay, so let's get back to the presentation. We've seen the little video. A little bit of history, just for the reference. Um, well, this guy here, Henry Roy Hood, builds the first semi-automated DNA sequencer in 1984. Okay, and part of this work later on was capitalized by a company which is now, uh, uh, well, the API 370 protein sequencer. So this actually, this machine used to give you the proteins, the peptides, okay, uh, the, the, the protein blocks. And that was in 1987. But again, this process was very, very slow, very, very time consuming and very expensive. For example, to sequence a very complex or a large genome, it will take you a lot of time and money. Then we have these guys here, uh, which they uh, won uh, the 1980 uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry, and quite rightfully so. Starting from the left, uh, Walter Gilbert, Frederick Sanger, and Paul Burke. For their contributions concerning the determination of base sequences in nucleic acids for the first two, and for his fundamental studies of the biochemistry of nucleic acids, with particular regard to recombinant DNA for Burke, the, the guy on the right here there. So these are the people that actually started thinking about how we automate this process to start from the basis, the nucleotide basis, and actually record them. Moving on, uh, two names you probably haven't heard but you have heard, for example, the technology of fire sequencing, which is commonly referred to as 454. Uh, they were based uh, in the Royal Institute of Technology, KTH, in Sweden, when they, they've done this. And they work collectively, ended up being what I said uh, as the 454 fire sequencing. Fire sequencing. No. Yes? And then... You have these two, three guys there in two companies, Illumina and Solexa. Solexa ended up being Illumina. It's commonly referred to as Illumina today. And these guys made it one step further and said, well, we have a great idea to take this process or these kinds of processes and reduce even further the cost and the time. Okay? The chemistry was uh, founded by these two, which at the time were scientists at, uh, in, in the United Kingdom at the University of Cambridge. Then they talked to this guy at the other side of the Atlantic. And the little company, Solexa, was acquired by Illumina to make you know, one of the most common and most frequently used uh, hydrocode sequences now. Enough with the history. I think you know with, with you know what, what they are trying to do. You know more or less the process of why, why high throughput sequencing, etc. Let's have a look at it now from the IT end. You probably have heard so far that uh, a life scientist produce more data than they can analyze. That's very true. But they need those data. It's, you know, they just. They don't do it just to occupy the disk space or, or CPU cycles. It's just that they're trying to get their bearings because um, one thing people don't appreciate is the fact that, okay, we have the code, right? We recorded something. We made it cheap to record it. 
and we can get pretty much reliable readings of the code. What does this code mean? What does it do? That's not so easy. And you know, the more complex, the more you get into it, the more complex it becomes, and the more data you need to, to assert your, your reasoning about what's happening here. So when these people produce the data and they have a very fairly large sequencing project, you will need to know uh, three things. How to store the data. So what equipment do you need to get to store uh, data for an NGS pipeline? How to move the data around? Because in principle, yes, here is the sequencer over there, where's the DB, and here's our CPUs. And we have to move what's in there here. Not so simple. Because you, when you see the, 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 the uh, quantity of data involved, you don't understand why. And then, what do you need to process this data? And by process, in this particular case, I don't mean a program uh, that will actually give the answer to every question for life, but I mean the sequence assembly process. You know, you get your reads, you have, you know, millions of reads, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of reads, and then you are trying to get the, the big sequence, the assembled sequence. Okay? And that's a very heavy, normally very heavy computational process. So, you heard about petaflop, gigaflop, petaflot, but, uh, you know, uh, there's a very nice article uh, it's actually in, uh, uh, by the Nature Publishing Group. Big data, welcome to the Beta Center. And um, what they mean is the effect that data intensive sciences, NGS, next generation sequencing is one of them, one discipline in life sciences. But there are others, there are astrophysics, there are theoretical physics. For example, the, the guys at, uh, at CERN, the Large Hydron Collider, that you know, they are trying to, to actually answer essential questions. They produce petabytes of petabytes of data. Okay? So while the physicists and the life scientists are trying to answer the questions, some other people trying to enable them to run and manage all this data so that they can answer the questions. And this is the case, the same case with NGS more or less. And this is what I like to show, the petabyte thing. Okay? I'm not, I don't want you now to go through all the equations and, and etc. But this is, I present one example here. And I'm considering a, a sequence facility that has, for example, uh, most of them now do mixed sequencing. They use mixed methods, so they have probably an Illumina 4.4 and probably a, a solid. And let's say that these people do uh, something like a metagenomics project or comparative genomics project. What does this mean? I mean that when they sequence something, they need to sequence it over a number of times. Like taking, for example, screens or, or organisms in different environments. Okay? To deduce conclusions about not only what this life uh, what this living thing is, is actually made of, but how the environment interacts with it. And I say for the sake of argument that for each of these we do a uh, hundred runs per year. Entire one here is what you get per time, per time, not, not for a hundred times, you know, for a hundred runs, for one run. Okay? Uh, using different instruments. And as I'm speaking now, these figures are probably very, very low. Because the more advanced the sequencers get, because you know you get the Illumina sequencer, this Illumina sequencer will have latter models, it will have firmware upgrades that enable it to, to be more precise, but at the same time produce more data. So this might be actually fairly low figures. Okay? So, time one refers to uh, the data that actually, the actual images with the quality control scores, okay, on those images, that are produced by the sequencer. 
So this is, right, I put this thing in a hundred times, each time will give me this amount of data. When we get these images, we will probably extract the sequences, okay? So there is a stage, for example, where we call it the quality stage, where you'll get the sequence. The sequence, of course, will be in a, typically in a FASTQ file or a, a particular file that contains the reads plus quality scores. These quality scores indicate what's the likelihood that the machine has probably done a mistake in that particular read somewhere. So this information then is taken into account in tire 3 when they do the final assembly for its run. And you can see, of course, that because we disregard the images and the original images, which are very data intensive, uh, you know, you, you get sequences here only. And that's the final goal. But nevertheless, that's a big amount of information. Okay, again, these are rough figures. It doesn't mean that for every project you'll get 100 gigs. But, you know, it's a, it's a realistic example that we got with rounded numbers more or less, that we got from uh, different sequencing platforms in, in, in our world. If you normally uh, introduce a fourth tire here, which I recommend, and this fourth tire, what it does, it contains data that you need to keep, plus your current data, over a number of years. The next slide has some equations that help you to to find out those numbers. Because you will find that in order to produce these numbers, you need $40,000, $60,000, not including the CPU time, the electricity, uh, the man hours that went into analyzing all this data. So this is actually a backup stage. Okay? And here you have the total number of terabytes on a large project that you can actually have stored in your system. I haven't seen many jobs, many draw, many, uh, many uh, <laughs> open mouths, but uh, that was my intention because, you know, uh, especially for the Illumina, which seems to be Is the most exabyte. Uh, that's a that's a petabyte. No, no, no. Okay, that's a petabyte. And there is a petabyte for you. <laughs> it's like what you consider today uh, with a terabyte disk. You can get just a USB disk with a terabyte, you know, you know, of capacity. Yeah, if you said that to somebody six or seven years ago, he would say you are mad. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, you can very easily push and reach the limits of storage, data storage. Okay. Again, please don't go away and think that. We have, uh, we have uh, you all need to go away and get a petabyte. Please don't do that, but I'm trying to show you a, a, a way to estimate your storage and make this table. And these are, uh, I should have some equations here. These are the tired storage equations. Oops. Good. Um, so, what you need to do, and you need to understand here, is that you have storage tires. Ignore this uh, MIHP, this is probably somebody typing, this is probably my cat typing on keyboard. <laughs> um, so, the first storage, storage tire one, is what the, the, sequence, the sequencer will dump into your disk. So this is typically what you would get through uh, NFS or CIFS or, you know, by collecting all the instruments output into an FTP area or a large area. And there is where you need to have most of the capacity. Tires 2 and 3 are typically associated with what crunches the data. So this could be, for example, a large uh, disk in your cluster. Okay. You don't need to move all these images to your cluster. That would be, no, that would be mad. You don't need to. And then tire three and uh, tire four is something that you would probably, uh, it's a let's say a project backup of steps two and three, uh, plus a period of 
keeping the data. For example, we need to back up data for some clinical projects for at least two or three years before the project finishes. It. And it's a law, it's a requirement. Maybe your scientists will set this requirement, maybe your government will set this requirement, maybe some other regulatory uh, information that you need to, to keep data for. Pretty much like, you know, if you are an ISP in Europe now, you need to keep email or the police records for a certain number of time. You need to work out them. Yes? So, so each entire equation is related the with a different stage of uh, yes. project? Yes. Okay. Yes. And the, it, that's the only way your system can cope. Because if you put everything in one volume or one set of volumes, uh, both in terms of the capacity and in terms of the I.O., because you, you have to actually, uh, it's not only the, the number of information, but the rate with which the information will be thrown from the instrument to a, a large repository area. So tire storage, you need, you need to design your tires. And this is uh, the reason. This is how. Okay? Uh, there is a very nice article on uh, the Mnet journal that actually goes to, I can probably find it out, that I wrote about this uh, two or three years ago when people started really trying to design uh, infrastructures. But uh, typically, what I want you to keep from now, because it's too late in the day to start looking at the equations, is this. As a proof that, you know, you need capable storage. There's another nice table here, uh, courtesy of uh, Elliot Markils in, uh, from the NIH. And what he's showing you here is the different sequencing technologies. Here, some important parameters, like for example, the technology they, they use, the type of chemistry, for example, the read length in basis, you know, the more, uh, the newer the technique it seems, that the shorter the read length, and therefore the greater the need to have capable assembly algorithms. Because if I have, for example, a genome that's uh, the entire genome is, like, say, two megabases, uh, and I have theoretically it's read that to be three kilobases rather than 500 bases or 75 bases, as you consider, the assembly becomes much more difficult. The shorter the read length. Uh, the greater the need for a, a, a nice assembly and CPU power. But are the reads longer with more machines? There are, there are long, I mean, the Sanger, the original Sanger technique work was producing the longest reads. But, but uh, right, right now, most of these, for example, the Illumina will produce, uh, depending on what you do, anything between 75 or 100. I mean, this is, this is the average. Yes. But, for example, regarding his question, yeah. right now there's the update of the Perfect 4 platform that it's called Perfect 4 Plus. Yes. And the average read length is about 1,000 base per you, base for by read. You could. You yes. could, yes. Yes, that's correct. But you have to understand that these base pairs can be read, they will be given by the machine, but they have a quality score. Yes. Which means that what you read, might not end up being actually valid. And the algorithms later when you do the assembly and the quality control might reject it. Yes. So sometimes it's a sequencing strategy, there are specific tests, I don't want to now to get into the statistics, it's a, it's a big field, so you might hear about 10, 50 scores and 30, and etc. These are statistical tests to actually see the, the quality, of what, what, what's happening really with the quality of your reads. Etc. Here you see the cost of the machine. Uh, I mean, if you think that cost was uh, actually uh, fairly large, well, you can uh, probably uh, I can probably tell you that earlier sequencing platforms requires tens of millions of dollars in terms of just installing the instruments before these technologies. Okay. And here the pros and cons, uh, the biological applications, like what kind of uh, living organisms uh, uh, no, scientists normally uh, sequence with, uh, by using each platform, and etc. 
some people, for example, complain with a solid that uh, they used to have uh, long run times, for example. Used to take them a long time, etc. Okay. Here I'm just going through the tire storage, and again, I emphasize that you need to have tire storage because you can't just put everything under one file system. Uh, that would be wrong, architecturally wrong. Yes? Sorry, but the new version of Lumina, mm -hmm. I don't uh, save any photo anymore. Sure. Yes. Sure. Uh, however, what if you want to obtain this photo? You want to actually save it, like you want to save, but the new version don't save anything. Yeah. Well, lots of scientists don't like that so far. <laughs> so I, I presume, yeah. Um, the other thing that you need, I was about to say that, is that many of the instrument manufacturers now give you ready-made IT equipment that you can actually use from the sequencer, the workstation that controls the sequencer, the storage nodes uh, that you can actually use to store temporary data there for quality control and processing. But the truth of the matter is that if you run a, run a, a large facility, and especially a facility that does for example, mixed assembly, assembly from mixed methods. Mm -hmm. This data needs to be retained. And, uh, you know, at least that's a requirement for, uh, for some um, areas that I know of, for example, that, that they were not even clinical data. For example, in Norway, they sequence code. <coughs> Uh, but they, they would like to actually, uh, what they're doing now is resequencing with other technologies and then they do inevitably mixed assembly. So they need the new data plus the original data. Talking about storage. <coughs> You are familiar with all these file systems. Okay. How many do they use in an NGS environment, this XT3, XT4? You do. Have you tried to go above 16 terabytes? Don't. You won't. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's nothing wrong with using them. If, if your, if your uh, requirements, your storage requirements are uh, well under 16 terabytes, over the period of time, no problem, you can use them. I'm just pointing out that uh, size-wise, uh, they, 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 in terms of the volume, they, they uh, cannot scale, okay? I'm not talking about that, I'm not talking about that. I need to talk about this too. Anybody using ZFS? <laughs> what do you think about it? Can be slow when you scale up. But you can't scale. Yeah. Very dynamic. And you can get things like nice snapshots for the cap of entire volumes. Okay. What you tend to see a lot here in medium size installation is also XFS. Uh, XFS, for example, is commercially supported now on every commercially supported distribution up to 100 terabytes. It can be resized dynamically. And it's a good compromise between, let's say, a low grade file system, aka not scalable in terms of IOPS and capacity, and uh, you know something which is uh, much more professional. Talking about professional systems, what what uh, uh, people in large facilities tend to use is uh, these particular things here. Uh, there are plenty of people that actually use Panassas and Asylum storage. Anybody using these file systems here? Okay. Uh, GPFS, yeah. And uh, uh, Luster was actually mentioned by Jerome yesterday. Um, one thing that I have to tell you about Luster is that it can be a pain to install. And uh, the thing that you have to appreciate with uh, this sort of distributed parallel photography file systems is the fact that um, they require additional hardware. For example, in GPFS and in Lusser, you have metadata servers. 
pretty much like, for example, you run uh, your journal, which is your metadata in an XT3 or XT4, but you, nevertheless you don't need a, a separate server. To scale up on Luster, you need to have separate metadata servers, at least one. So the journal, who writes into what, what was the last write, where, uh, and by whom, is kept on a separate server than the actual data, the files. And this can create sometimes a problem. For example, you tend then to scale the storage, you can't, but you find that your metadata servers start becoming slow, etc. So that's Luster, right? Yeah, that's um, big users of Luster and uh, are uh, uh, um, essentially the at least it was a couple of years ago when I visited there was the Wellcome Trust Center Center in the UK. It's one of the largest sequencing facilities, so they, they use this. Uh, Jerome also mentioned yesterday NFS uh, or CIFS SMB, commonly known as Samba in, in your uh, speak. Um, what this can do is, uh, what these systems can do is they can actually help you shift information, okay, and share information. Like, for example, tier 2 and tier 3 storage, okay, um, between, you know, you have your sequences and you want to perform your analysis, etc. It could be your your uh, uh, something that could be an NFS import. Again, uh, you shouldn't really put more than fifty or sixty nodes in these uh, systems because you know they do very well up to this point. If you do a little bit of magic, like for example, small configuration parameters like the ones I demonstrated, uh, jumbo packets, etc., and uh, some some options, no way right and whenever you can afford to. But uh, uh, if, if you end up having hundreds of servers or thousands of servers, um, you could scale NFS horizontally, like make different volumes and then ask your scientists to actually, okay, here's part A of your data set, go to this NFS server, and then part B of your data set is, is into that NFS server, etc. Which, you know, depending on the flexibility of your of your users might work or not. The file system, as far as I know, is one of the most important choices that you're going to make. So it's hard. And the way you serve your data. Basic requirements, be scalable in size. Be scalable in the number of input output operations per second. Okay, uh, and I mentioned the example of, of read writes nested directory access. You have some applications that might create two or three millions of uh, files of 1K files, very small files, uh, in under 200 nested directories. You try to do that with XT3 or XT4, things are probably going to go very slow. Okay. And it has to do essentially with the ability of the file system, the data structure, the way the, the file system data are structured. Allow concurrent access. Um, concurrency is a big thing in, in uh, high performance computing. And uh, there are some categories of applications, the ones, for example, that has to do with uh, large data sets that are being annotated. These, they don't normally rely on, on, uh, on file systems, but they rely on relational database management systems, things like Oracle, MySQL, Postgres. Uh, who runs, for example, here a, a, a Biomart or DAS server? Uh, or, a, yeah, it, it's, it's a traditional approach for that problem. But nevertheless, these databases will need to write something to a file system. So all these things matter. And then high file redundancy replication features. The first time that I actually built the entire one storage, it was about 20 to 25 terabytes. I chose XFS. It was all working very well. I had uh, a backup, um, 
weekly backup on, on this volume with incremental backups based on a weekly basis. <laughs> and then one day uh, the file system broke because uh, you know, the controller, so I lost 25 terabytes of data. I didn't lose them, but when I say you lost them, uh, your loss cannot be always total, but it can be, it can take you up to two or three days or four days or two weeks to recover this sort of things. Like repair the controller, rebuild the volumes, verify the build volumes, verify the file system, and then uh, if you are not likely to have this to this backup and you're using tape, restore 20 terabytes of data from tape. Even if you have the best tape robot in the world, this will take some time. Okay? With things like Luster and GPFS and other parallel fault tolerance file systems, um, you have a lot of maintenance into keeping the file system running, but uh, when things break, you are safer and you are faster to recover. But again, this is a bit of a religious issue because for example, uh, I was having discussions with uh, colleagues of mine and uh, uh, one guy who really didn't like uh, Luster in my team told me if you really write down the number of hours that uh, I spent debugging and tuning the metadata servers it's probably equal, if not greater, than the time it takes you to have uh, uh, built the whole thing in XFS with a simple day backup. And okay, you're going to lose time, but at the end of the day, you can launch the operation and wait for the system to recover. And then focus on, on something else. Okay? Um, the people here, these people tend to be very good in the recovery issue as well. And as far as I know, these people will actually give you a guarantee. I mean, that doesn't sound a lot, but you know, if you have a proper service level agreement and you say, I'm going to pay you to maintain this, to give me firmware upgrades. I'll set it up, I'll run it, but if it breaks, you know, uh, you better, you, you better not break. Um, I've seen huge failures with these guys here, but they were, uh, most of these failures were quite quickly to, to recover with the support. And again, the larger the volumes that you have to deal with, and the criticality of the project and the time scales. Like for example, I have a group leader. The group leader has uh, a three-year grant. Three years sounds a lot of time to sequence something and, and, and do something. Three years sounds like a lot of time. Not really. If you see how much pressure these guys can apply to you, if you know you build everything for them and suddenly for three weeks you're offline because something went, went wrong, then uh, you, you can be certain that you have a problem, so. Were there any sequencing? Mainly they were sequencing cold. Cold? Fish, cold. Oh. Okay. Um, the data network and storage. We talked about file systems. But the idea is how these file systems are accessed not only by the, the uh, local host, okay, but also from remote hosts. And we talk about things like, for example, NFS. We talked about uh, uh, Samba CIFS. Um, but in the field of IT, every time we need to, to, to hit the TCP IP stack, what do I mean? You have file data. If you send them via NFS, this file data will be converted to an RPC data structure, RPC, Remote Procedure Code, embedded into it. Go inside a TCP IP, an IP packet. This IP packet needs to be encapsulated inside an Ethernet packet because obviously you have Ethernet. And uh, although this might not sound a lot to you, you know, when you transfer volumes of information, every little delay amounts. So, 
yes, in theory, you could move 20 terabytes from one node to another using NFS. You can optimize NFS, which is a blackout. I would recommend to do the same with CIFS somehow, but um, I don't consider it as a successful, well-performing approach. I mean, if you are within the region of two or three, up to five terabytes in say 50 to 60 nodes, yes, do it. You don't need to be concerned with adding complexity and you can rely on it. But if you pass those limits, you have to look here on a proper sound solution. And a proper sound means that with the exception of this guy here in the middle, the iSCSI, you're trying to bypass the TCP IP protocol suit, the network. For example, the fiber channel switches. I'm sure some of you will be, will be using fiber channel. It's a good technology. It's, uh, it's proven technology, but it's expensive. To have fiber channel storage, um, you know, you have to maintain the cost of the switches, the cost of the controllers, the cost pass adapters in, the, in your storage nodes, in every other node that needs to access these things separately, and it can give you a very big bill. But it performs very well. It performs great, in fact. Core the company used to introduce another thing which uh, was actually used in many large scientific installations, including CERN and NASA, called uh, ANTA over Ethernet. So they, they produce a card and they take the serial, the serial ATA protocol, or ATA SATA, and instead of encapsulating into an IP fragment, they dump it to, directly into an Ethernet frame, bypassing again TCP IP. That has also decent performance. But there are, you know, new kids on the block. New, new technologies uh, um, in the market. And if you ever need to architect a very, very large installation or an expanding installation beyond the limits I mentioned before, these are some of the uh, uh, good questions that you need to ask to your storage side. Can you afford the pure fiber channel? maintain it in the long term? If you can, no, that's okay, uh, no problem. Uh, how many storage interconnects you have in your machine? Right? Well, you might have a uh, pure gigabit Ethernet that runs NFS, okay? You might have fiber channel that runs your perhaps RDBMS expensive storage, the Oracle storage. You might have infinite band for uh, low latency storage that's actually used in clusters, high performing computing clusters. But, you know, when your resources are limited, whether we're talking about money or, or uh, you know, uh, human resources in terms of how many people you have to allocate and how many hours, uh, the magic word has always been in the IT industry uh, is to uh, consolidate. The Hitachi person actually mentioned the technology I'm going to introduce and I have been uh, trying extensively with good results and that's fiber channel over Ethernet. So the idea is that if you have fiber channel hosts that have the host block adapters, okay, you don't throw all this technology away but you can uh, get something we call a converged network card here is your Ethernet frame, but instead of having here the normal IP fragments for storage, you can have a fiber channel frame. It's a relatively new technology. Um, it slowly crawls its way and actually proves itself. Well, for example, three or four years ago, it was fairly unstable because it was not standardized very well. I think that now the standards, the FCOE standards, are have matured enough for somebody to make a, a good investment. And in terms of performance and simplicity, that means you can have your Ethernet switch. You can uh, make VLANs on your Ethernet switch that are actually fiber channel only, so not TCP/IP. These uh, VLANs, and you can have your normal TCP/IP VLANs on the other hand. And you know. Uh, this is a workstation, you have your storage there, 
you don't need to actually uh, be worried about uh, uh, putting fiber channel switches there. You just need to make sure that you have a conversion network adapter and connect an extra Ethernet cable. This is where I think the whole industry is, uh, is moving slowly. Uh, but but uh, I've seen many NGS installations, quite hefty ones, that are actually utilizing COE. Simply because the storage admins were said, well, okay, um, we can't afford to, or we don't want to have three or four different interconnects, we want to have one. Please give us something that works more or less uh, on, on average so for everything. And this is... Uh, uh, what, what it really means. I mean, before you had your Ethernet core network, you have, uh, for example, your storage array here with your disks, you had your fiber channel sound, so these are where your, your switches, and then you have your uh, uh, edge switches here, and these were your servers here. So you wanted to save something via NFS, you have to go that way or that way. You wanted to actually uh, talk. To the disks via NFS, you have to go. You have to go that way, all the way backwards and forwards. That's a lot of overhead. That, that, that will not scale. What you do instead is you have either a mixed environment, where, for example, new equipment can actually use converged network ad adapters and FCOE uh, Ethernet switches, and then you can still have your own your old fiber channel equipment switches in place. And eventually you go to a pure FCOE environment when your last of your FC switches die and you shouldn't replace them. That's at least what I've done with my, my storage. And um, so far I haven't, I haven't regretted it. Any questions about the storage or, or any points or any... No. Okay. Now what I want to talk to you about is the NGS computing part, meaning the CPU crunching part, which is um, actually uh, the one that I think it's more interesting. Uh, and why it's more interesting? Because, well, um, it utilizes pure computer science uh, uh, concepts like, like graph theory, for example. Uh, to its limits, uh, it can give you, uh, it can push the system to its limits in terms of uh, both threads for CPU and processes and also memory. Most sequence assembly uh, uh, jobs are very, very memory intensive. Okay? Um, I mean, you have essentially your reads here. You're trying to uh, make the consensus, like the, the, the overlap, you know, see where the sequences overlap. And uh, um, this, in principle, is done with a, a, a particular type of graph data structure called the De Bruyne graph, for some of the most successful uh, assemblers. Uh, so essentially, you use a graph data structure to say where you should actually place the reads in order to align them properly and then count and see what is the entire sequence. I can't put it simpler than that. Um, so this is what the De Bruyne graph looks like. Um, there's a very nice nature uh, article there that actually explains uh, how to get the complete sequence from short read overlapping sequences because this is the main problem in uh, high throughput sequencing. Um, and this paper also mentions some tools and, and, uh, and technologies. And the idea is that uh, it's a, a state-enabled graph. And what you do, however, what you do is you can make it very complex. For example, um, uh, you read the sequence, you read the next sequence, and then you see if you have common elements. <coughs> On the basis of the common elements and the quality score, you assign weights here. And then you go to the next node. But you do this billions of times, okay? Um, in order to, to, to actually do a large assembly. Awesome. 
some of the most common players that you are going to be concerned with on the uh, uh, assembly end is Velvet. This, one, this is one of the most memory intensive ones, in fact. Uh, actually, I know one which is more memory intensive, probably you have heard about it, it's called Myra, it's an open source assembler. Uh, it tends to be very, very memory intensive. Uh, so, the novel, Cortex, Abyss, uh, this is the latest, uh, a relatively newcomer, Curtin, that actually tries to address the memory usage. So, the people that EBI that made it claim that it's uh, one of the most memory efficient assemblies that people actually have, but not very well known at the moment, at least not in the entire community. Neither Cortex. Sorry. Neither Cortex is yes. So, so yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I run a couple of courses about, and I can tell you that uh, at least this guy here might not give you the best data sets, but it's good to run your data sets through it because if you don't have a, a very large computing environment in terms of memory, um, <laughs> it, it, it's worth a try. But most people will insist with uh, this guy here, uh, this guy for solid data, and this guy, Velvet. So you're gonna, you're gonna hear about that. Um, talking about memory requirements. <laughs> uh, the first time I went to my director and said, I need the one tin machine. A one terabyte machine, yes. He, he's like. <laughs> and the guy said, uh, all right, how much does it cost? And then I said, a bigger, I don't know, $40,000, $50,000. He was like, why do you need so much memory? Well, um, this is why you need so much memory. <laughs> this is another job. Um, which is also, the reason I included Ray it's because it's one of the latest pieces of code and uh, what it does it's thread plus memory intensive so what you have here is a typical 32 uh, core CPU there is a user here that has started a job uh, it's, this is a single job spread across 32 threads 32 processes so it occupies fully the processor, and each one of them at the time was 2 gigs. Okay, This is a single job, not, not 32 different jobs, but it's a, you know, a job that's actually spread across the entire course. And I imagine two or three users doing the same, or you know, imagine that if this guy could actually start two or three separate jobs. You could put limits, of course, into the queue systems and limit the amount of processes and limit the amount of memory. But uh, if you do that, he is never going to enter the dataset. Okay. So if you do the math here, uh, you uh, have just with one job about 70 gigs of RAM and 100% CPU utilization on a fairly hefty, hefty one. Okay. Yeah, I could give you uh, screenshots of Velvet trying to reach uh, uh, 512 gigs of RAM. It's the same. Uh, everybody knows, knows that. And uh, uh, the more you can... So in, in your infrastructure, my point is that, is that you could have at least one fat memory node. You're not going to regret that investment. Okay? Because if you don't, there is no way that you can open MPI these algorithms and spread them across a cluster. That you will reach a point where the inter-process communication to, to sync the sets in the graph will be too large. So, my conclusion is that so far, to date, most sequence assemblers are shared memory computing paradigms where you require uh, not necessarily a lot of cores, but you require a lot of memory. For the, for the assembly process. So do invest 
and uh, you know, don't expect from people to complete large projects. Uh, let's say anything that's over two megabases, and it's the novel, or you know, uh, or you can you can have something like a. 70 million reads and you want to complete this uh, without having a capable memory machine. Put it as part of your queue in the cluster. Restrict access only, perhaps in the queue, to the people that only read to run assembly jobs. So for example, if you run a, a cluster and you have only two or three people that will do the assembly, make sure that from your queue system only these two or three people can submit jobs for this, for this node, so that nobody occupies without reason this node. And um, yeah. you, you, it's one of the most frequent heat limits in AGS processing. The amount of RAM that you have in the node. I just want to show you a bit what a fairly not large, but, but uh, considerable facility looks like, uh, NGS facility in the computing end. What we have here is on the left, uh, the sequencers, okay? Here we have uh, router and switch aggregation, so this is our COMS equipment that actually uh, runs the VLANs, our FCOA switches, our uh, 10G backbone switches, our 1G distribution switches for everything. And what I tend to do with the clouds here, I assigned different VLANs, okay? So, for example, what I tend to do is to actually have uh, the sequencing workstations or the computing storage, the Illumina storage nodes or the CPU nodes, uh, have converged network adapters. I'm going to show you which network adapters I use. And actually map physically in block mode uh, not, not via TCP IP or NFS, disks. Where are the disks? Here, in my rack. Okay. Here uh, we have uh, access to a supercomputer here. Uh, here is my tire 4 data, backup, disk to disk in Tate, Tate Robot. Uh, quite large EMC and uh, TSM, uh, IBM Tivoli Storage Manager, you know. Um, and here I have my uh, number cruncher, yes, and including the fat memory nodes, like two fat memory nodes, like the ones I described. So let's visualize a bit the workflow. Uh, people actually dump the raw image data into tire one here. From tire one data, I have, for example, small batches of cluster nodes to do the QC, the scores, etc., as part of the queue. And these are actually exported via, via NFS because I have up to 20 or 30 nodes there per, per sequencer. And essentially the rest of the storage is, uh, 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 creates shared file systems with uh, the things that do the assembly there. So, um, again, aggregating the traffic via VLANs and having uh, a good 10G switch, which I know it's expensive, but uh, it would be more expensive for us to actually have separate uh, FC switches, five channel switches to, to damage all this traffic. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the way we run it, essentially. What is the, the part at the top of the... Here? Yeah, this is uh, when we run out of some uh, uh, local juice power, we can tap into a larger cluster, which is part of the university. I mean, this is a, a 20,000 or old Titan in, in Norway. And uh, it can also interface to grid, not to grid, and, and etc. So uh, sometimes we find, for example, that people that run uh, uh, molecular dynamic simulations, they are, you know, they are far better off here than, than in our systems because our systems are more dimensioned for storage and uh, for assembly. The storage, uh, 
part of, of this uh, instructor. It's it's a part because you need the security in that system, or why is not connected to the rest of the uh, the rest? Well, um, the reason is that uh, the people that actually produce the data here in the sequencing facility might be from different institutes. So yes, we need to provide some degree separation, some degree of data access. For example, can I delete this? Or? Yes. What do I mean by that? I'll just be very... I think I might even have a video to show how we do this from the, the uh, graphical user interface, the disk management. But uh, let's say that, for example, this week um, the sequences are used by, let's say, sequencer 1, S2, and this week they are used by guy A, or center A. Okay? These workstations have the converged network adapters, so they talk uh, FCOE. And what FCOA allows me to do is to map like uh, block devices, like that were actually attached locally, uh, a series of disks here. These disks are disks that reside in the in the storage node, you know, in the storage racks there. But they are different for person A and different for person B. Why? Because you know. Uh, Scientists, at least some of them, tend to be very privy, and you know, despite the fact that uh, that uh, you know, I ensure them that I can put ACOs and file system permissions, and nobody else is going. I said no. We want to use our own disks. Often they pay for their own disks because if there is somebody that then tries to sequence something which is ten times the capacity that I can actually handle, I'm going to ask him to pay for the disks. There is no way I can pay for his. Uh, this. Okay, and then when person B does the same thing two months later, he has access to uh, another row of disks. Because what I do is I go here to the workstation and say, uh, well, for user A, map uh, slash dev slash SDA, for user B, map slash dev slash SDB. It's like this, these disks are, it's like they are being local here. Like I have a virtual cabinet that I actually connect via the FCOA. Mm -hmm. But because this happens every one year or six months or whatever the sequencing uh, project lasts for until they dump the data for tire one, for tire two then they have different uh, areas, shares. On, but this is NFS in, in, in Samba. So I just do this map switching to make sure that everybody owns his own disks. Mm -hmm. So there is no uh, you know argument about who's producing most of the data or who's occupying most of the space. And uh, I change these quotas every every three to six months, depending on the, the project. The rest of it is pretty static in the sense that we have a fixed number of processing nodes and a fixed number of uh, 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 memory nodes that everybody sort of like started contributing in order to run their assembly jobs. Just do it. Yes? Um, has anybody used TCB? Samba? CT uh, sorry, CTDB. Okay. Um, uh, I advised one on a, on a facility that was actually smaller. They wanted to be independent because they, they had to be independent. So they had uh, file servers and of course they had then their sequencers. And they said, well, our users know nothing about computers. They, they just want to see a drive letter, X, Y, Z, whatever, B, C, D, and dump their data. And I said, well, okay, why don't you, why don't you make a Samba share? He said, okay, yes, but how do we add uh, uh, 
90 or 100 terabytes or 150 terabytes. I said, do you have the money for a sun? They said, no, we don't have the money for a sun. We don't have the manpower and we don't have the time to set it up. So what I've done is taken their existing Linux servers. These they were running, you know, directly at that storage and run a thing called CTDB. Problem? Problem? No. Um, yeah. And uh, this essentially allows me to combine all the volumes of all servers into one letter for these workstations. This is another very nice technique that, you, you know, it's not so uh, professional, but uh, the people that actually use this, which is part of the assembly uh, team, that was their, their goal. This is another little trick if you don't have money to invest in a large storage array or a professional sum or have a look at this. This was the idea of the Hitachi like that. I'm not sure it's so professional as it touch me. I'm not sure it's professional at all. But as long as you you have some disk storage in each of your servers, because they had two or three production file servers. So what they added for these purposes is they added a number of cabinets, just with a, another SATA cable on the controller. But then they wanted this to show as one. As one. So they had uh, 10 disks here. This node, 10 disks there, 10 disks on the other node. And I wanted the 30 disks to show under Windows in one drive letter. Because they didn't want Linux, they didn't want I mean, Linux on the desktop. Right? They had Linux servers on as file servers. Um, so, as far as I know, they still run it. And they, they haven't got a Hitachi or another solution. Or Okay. I want to finish with the bill of materials. Um, what I said about the switches, I mean, uh, there are cheaper switches now, but uh, uh, at the time where I designed the architecture, uh, I had to choose the Cisco. We are pretty much a Cisco shop. Our main core campus was, uh, and still is, a, a Cisco campus. So, you know, being familiar with the iOS and the way to run the VLANs and etc. I invested on uh, the Switch 5000 Nexus. Uh, these are the modules that you can actually fit. Uh, there can be different modules here. I mean, all these are FCOA compatible ports in 10G. And you can actually have optical modules for, uh, for example, uh, creating bonded interfaces between floors or, you know, sequence rooms and etc. Bonded meaning, you know, you create in Cisco switch and uh, ether channel, the trunk. Um, and at the server and desktop end, I chose the QLogic QLE8152 10GB converged network adapter. Converged means that it talks Ethernet, but it also talks FCOA. So one of these ports here was pure TCP IP and was used for network communications and NFS imports and the other was actually dedicated to FCOA so it was talking only in the VLAN for storage oh, so, so you need that the, the, uh, the adapter yeah uh, it's you need the CNN compatible for the CNN yes. Oh. yes otherwise you won't be able to talk to in okay. FCOA mode um, for storage and CPU, I mean, uh, we used uh, these are fat nodes. Um, I think this is, uh, depending on your manufacturer here, the best bang for the buck because these are AMD processors. The R815, I packed it with 512 and 32 cores. So, this actually, I, I use them for the sequence assembly jobs. The rest, you know, run MRS and the QC and the other processing and emboss are this sort of type, Intel 1950, probably obsolete nowadays. And this is my storage orient, which uh, it's the EMC Clarion CX4 with uh, FCOE support modules to talk. 
And uh, well, that's about it. <laughs> Sure. Uh, uh, there's really answers many of the things that I need to learn from this. Sure, but, sure. But as a, as a general or a, a, a compilation of the, of the information that we saw, mm -hmm. would you say, like, from a what part figure, mm -hmm. how much, because we have these figures of how much is the price for a base? In sequence, in sequence of nodes. But they met, neither the scientists nor the, 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 the companies add the, the information at the, about the processing and biomathematic and storage uh, costs. Yes, so these are hidden, hidden costs. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if you could uh, put the, the, uh, drop, the drop, is this happened to us in Norway as well. Are we still recording? So no, oh, oh, We're not recording yet. Okay. Uh, okay, well, then we can take it afterwards <laughs> because it's more. I mean, I can I can give you some uh, figures based on prices that we get here, but I can't really talk okay. if, if I'm about this thing. So yes, but I can I can give you the exact figures of of here. Okay. <laughs> Do you have some suggestion for tuning the NFS in Brazil? For tuning. For tuning. Yes. I demonstrated with them uh, more or less. Well, I, I mean, th there are there are work easy if you use the defaults, or you can. There are some things it. you can do, um, and, and uh, these are uh, things that you know. First of all, um, you need to make sure that you need to visualize the structure of the data that you are trying to. To uh, serve, but there are some general rules. The first rule is to enable uh, 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 if all your nodes supported, like servers and the workstations, jumbo frames. Um, by jumbo frames, I mean Ethernet frames that are larger than one five thousand, one 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 thousand five hundred. Sorry. And for gigabit Ethernet, you can go all the way up to 9,000. So, if I want to be specific, I can go and try to log in now and log into my server and show you. Did I show this when I actually demonstrating the MRS or? We talked about it. Yeah. But I'll show you now. One second. See. Ah, great. Okay. So, um, let me see a bit the interfaces. Um, okay, that was done. Another NFS server. So, if I go to I have config ETH uh, zero ETH one and two. Okay, this is the the one that I want to show you. It's config um, uh, network network scripts and then we want the interface configuration for um, ETH2 I mean this these two lines MTU equals 9000 and MTU 9000 so this you have to do in all the nodes the node that you export the file systems and the node that you import the file systems into Okay. And the idea is that because then you can you can uh, fit more things into a frame, things go normally faster. Yes. Um, the other thing you could do is you can actually uh, speed up NFS by using certain options when you import uh, file systems. Like for example, 
I might have an option here. Uh, let's go into the node that I have the MRS, the MRS as an example. I'm just going to show you. And then I'll have a look at the FS tab file here where I NFS import something. You see these options here? Um, for example, I define the word, the read size and the write size as 8192 close to the uh, 9K limit of the frame. So it's IP protocol plus Ethernet frames, some, some overhead. But there are also nice things like options, like if you have, for example, a directory with very large files, but let's say it has 60 large files, nobody's going to write to this directory. You only want to people to read. Export the file system as read only and use an option called no subtree check. That speeds immensely NFS because many people use NFS to move data. So you could have, for example, flows where you have a very large volume, you put your large files that everybody should download or have access to, but no write access, only read access. And this can go very, very fast. Um, Another option which we had uh, when, when, for example, you have three or four servers only, not tens or twenty or hundreds or thousands of servers, is to use, uh, if you don't have 10G, uh, Ethernet bonding. Yes, so if you have a server, um, number three, let's say S1 and S2, and each one of them has, for example, uh, one gigabit Ethernet interface dual. If I really wanted to have high performance NFS between these two boxes, I would add another network interface card with, uh, let's say, another two modules on the PCI Express bus, if I have a, a slot there, free. And I would create a virtual interface between the two like a 2G link. If that card is a 10G link, 10G, 10 generation, uh, 10G, 10 gigabit Ethernet, you can reach the astronomical 20G. And then you can play with either larger frame sizes there. And, and have very, very fast I.O. between the two servers. What I tend to do, I tend to do this with servers between, uh, for example, people that uh, query Oracle servers or MySQL servers. So in one server they have the MySQL client that asks, asks all the SQL queries and wants to get back from the client then huge amounts of information to the database. And the other one is the database server. So. You know, your mind, uh, uh, tuning NFS is a bit of a, of a black art, but uh, you know, if you have a specific setup that you have problems, you can ask me because there are all the other parameters are specific to your setup. I'm sorry I can't be more specific, but you know, you, I need to know what you need to export, I need to know, these are generic tool, generic uh, instructions that you can, you can follow. Okay, more questions? No. Too late. It's <laughs> <laughs>